So welcome everybody. I am so excited to have you in class today. This is the last class from the National Constitution Center for the 2021 year. And what a great way to wrap up this class but with one of our favorite scholars, historians, and my favorite read of the month. And so great conversation that we're gonna have today around slavery in America and American history overall. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And I'm really excited to kick off this class and to remind you during class, we love your questions. So feel free to put them in the chat, feel free to put them in the Q&A, any way you wanna get there. Now, our guest VIP today is Professor, Doctor, and Mr. Clint Smith. We're excited to have him here. I have to do a shout out to you, sir, because my great friend, Cheryl Logan, was so unbelievably excited that one of her teachers um, is going to be our in class today. So she wanted me to say hello to you as well before we get started. But if you don't know Dr. Smith, he is an amazing writer for The Atlantic. He has written the book that has been my favorite this month, and I know Jeff's favorite as well, How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with History, the History of Slavery Across America, and has just launched an amazing Crash Course series on um, Black American history. So, so many things to dive into, so many questions to ask. And I'm so lucky that we're here with the president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, Jeffrey Rosen. So Jeff, I'm gonna turn it over to you to kick us off. Thank you so much, Curry. And welcome, Clint Smith. All of us are so honored and excited to be with you. And I think we all agree with our friend Elizabeth Messenger, who just put in the chat, feeling starstruck at sharing this session with none other than Clint Smith. Uh, your powerful book uh, has uh, so inspired um, people across America and around the world to learn about the history of slavery. And I thought that one great way that we might share your light with our students is just to walk through with you the eight places that you visited to explore the history of slavery, uh, beginning with your own hometown of New Orleans and then moving on to Monticello, the Whitney Plantation, Angola Prison, Blanford Cemetery, Galveston Island, New York City, and Gory Island. Why don't we just go through each of those locations and, and share with us what you learned beginning with New Orleans? Yeah, so the, the origin story of the book is, uh, it began in 2017, and I was watching several Confederate statues come down in my hometown in New Orleans, statues of PGD Beauregard, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee. And I was watching these statues come down, and I was thinking about what it meant that I grew up in a majority Black city in which there were more homages to enslavers than there were to enslaved people. And what are the implications of that? What does it mean that to get to school, I had to go down Robert E. Lee Boulevard? To get to the grocery store, I had to go down Jefferson Davis Parkway. That my middle school was named after a leader of the Confederacy. That my parents still live on a street today, named after someone who owned over 150 enslaved people. Because we know that symbols and names and iconography aren't just symbols. They are reflective of the stories that people tell. And those stories shape the narratives that communities carry. And those narratives shape public policy and public policy shapes the material conditions of people's lives. And that's not to say that taking down a 60 foot tall statue of Robert E. Lee is gonna suddenly erase the racial wealth gap, but it is to say that it helps remind us that these stories and ideas are part of a, an ecosystem of narratives that help us understand what has transpired throughout American history and then better inform and equip us with which to understand the harm that has been done to certain communities throughout American history. And so when we, when we have that, we are able to look around our country and understand that the reason one community looks one way and another community looks another way is not simply because of the individual decisions of people in those communities, but is because of what has been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. And so I was thinking about what it looked like, what, what memory of slavery uh, looked like in, in New Orleans uh, and in my hometown, who was telling the story honestly, who was failing to tell the story honestly, and who was doing something in between. And then I got, I sort of broadened it out and began thinking about, well, how did different parts of this country reckon with or fail to reckon with this history um, and went on what ended up being a sort of four year journey to, to figure that out. Wow, thank you for sharing that origin story and for leading us to the next place that you visited, hard to think of a place more charged in American memory, and that's Monticello. Tell us what you learned there. So Monticello is, uh, the reason why I wanted to go there, for folks who might not know, Monticello is the home of Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States, one of our founding fathers, 
And Jefferson for me sort of personifies the story of America in the sense that America is a place that has provided unparalleled, unimaginable opportunities for millions of people across generations in ways that their ancestors could have never imagined. But it has also done so at the direct expense of millions and millions of other people who have been intergenerationally subjugated and oppressed. And both of those things are the story of America. It's not just one over here and one over here, it's that they are both deeply interwoven with one another. They go hand in hand. And Jefferson, I think, like I said, similarly, is reflective of that cognitive dissonance. Um, he is someone who wrote in one document that all men are created equal and wrote in another document that black people are inferior to whites in both endowments of body and mind. He is someone who wrote one of the most important documents in the history of the Western world in the Declaration of Independence, but also is someone who enslaved, enslaved over 600 people over the course of his lifetime, including four of his own children that he had by an enslaved woman on his plantation, Sally Hemings. And so when we think about Jefferson, how do we recognize that we, when we think of Jefferson as <clears throat> the statesman, as the scholar, as the scientist, as the philosopher, all of that is deeply entangled with the reality of Jefferson as an enslaver, because it was enslavement that made his life possible. It was enslavement that allowed for all of those other things to happen. Um, and so part of what, um, sorry, one second. Part of what I think is really important um, is when I was going to Monticello, I was thinking, well, how does this place tell the story or fail to tell the story of Jefferson? Like when we tell the story of Jefferson, are we being honest um, about, uh, about who he was, but also are we telling the story of what Monticello, who Monticello belonged to other than Jefferson, which is to say it didn't only belong to Jefferson, it belonged to the hundreds of enslaved people who lived at Monticello as well, the Hemingses, the Fawcett's, the Grangers, the, uh, the, you know, so many of these folks who built communities there, the, who built uh, family there, who built uh, memories there, who cultivated that land, who, who made, who built the buildings on that land. And I remember there was a, a moment where I was on the tour with a guy named David Thorson. And David in 45 minutes gave this masterclass of the sort of contradictions and hypocrisy of Jefferson's intellectual project. And I was watching these two women, Donna and Grace, and I was watching them and as I was speaking, as, as David was speaking, you could see their sort of faces wilting and their mouths hang agape. They were so shocked and so surprised by what they were hearing. And I went up to them after and I was like, I would love to hear more about how, you know, how you were impacted on your reaction to so much of what David was saying. And I remember Donna was like, man, you really took the shine off the guy. She said, I had no idea Jefferson owned slaves. I had no idea Monticello was a plantation. And mind you, these are folks who bought plane tickets, rented cars, got hotel rooms, who came to this site as a sort of pilgrimage to see the home of one of the founding fathers and, and had no idea that he was an enslaver, had no idea that his home was a plantation. And that moment was really important because it was, I think, uh, emblematic for me about how there are so many millions of people across this country who continue to not uh, understand the history of slavery in any way that is commensurate with the actual impact and legacy that it has had on this country. Very powerful story. Our friend uh, Tiffany Landry asks in the chat, have you learned anything new or made new connections during the process of sharing or promoting the book? In what ways are you still learning and reckoning? It's a great question and maybe you could uh, talk about it in connection with Monticello or with our next location, which is the Whitney Plantation in Louisiana. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that question. I, so the Whitney is a place that um, is, is interesting because I think it's, it's fascinating to put it in conversation with Monticello. Monticello is a place that is only now, uh, you know, it's existed for hundreds of years um, since, the, since the 18th century. Uh, and it is only now in the most in the in the past couple of years and in some ways in the past couple of decades it's beginning to tell a more honest story about about itself right so its origin story was not one you know when it became a museum it was not at all interested in telling a story about jefferson as an enslaver and not at all telling a story about jefferson's enslaved children about sally hemmings none of that was mentioned i think that um Whitney, on the other hand, in Louisiana, is a place that was founded on the premise that we cannot understand a plantation as anything other than an, 
an intergenerational site of torture and exploitation. Um, and as a result, what it has done is created a place that is, you know, part of what surrounds the, the Whitney is this constellation of plantations where people continue to hold weddings and, and formal ceremonies and big parties. And where, you know, I talked to wedding planners down in Louisiana and they talk about how some people would still use the bridal cabins uh, in some of these plantations, or excuse me, some people would still use the slave cabins at some of these plantations as bridal suites for their, uh, for their, for their weddings. And so the Whitney is a place that exists in this ecosystem of, of places that have a really contorted uh, relationship to the history of slavery and are in many ways not actually engaging with it meaningfully at all. And the Whitney sits in the middle of this and says, we can only understand, as I said, this, we can only understand the plantation as being a site of intergenerational torture and exploitation, while also making sure that we are reminded constantly of the humanity uh, and the personhood of the people who were enslaved. Because I think when you hear like, we have four, you know, 4 million enslaved people at the beginning of the Civil War, those numbers are so big that they become abstractions, almost, you know, in a different way, but similar to, you know, we've had 800,000 people die from COVID-19 over the past two years in the United States, and even that's likely an undercount. And those numbers can be so big that we can lose a sense of the, the people who exist within them. And so I think one of the things that Whitney does really well, and this piece speaks to the question, is it really centers on like individual people and individual stories, and it makes you see their names and hear their voices and encounter um, you know, photos and likenesses of these individuals in ways that force you to confront that these were people, right? Who were living in what are simply unimaginable circumstances. I remember one time uh, when I was at the Whitney and I was standing, I was standing in the middle of the plantation and Yvonne Holden was the uh, director of operations who was giving me the tour, was telling me the story about families who were separated um, from their children, uh, parents were separated from their children. And at this point I had uh, a son and I had a daughter on the way. And I had a moment where I tried to imagine if I were in my home with my family, with my two children. And I tried to imagine if I woke up one day and my children were gone and I had no idea where they were. I had no idea who had taken them. I had no idea if I would ever see them again. It's almost unfathomable. Like it's, it's, it's almost impossible to wrap my head around what that would be like. And yet, the Whitney is a place that reminds you that that is the omnipresent threat that hung over millions of enslaved people every single day of their lives, right? It is not only the spectacle of cruelty, the beatings, the whippings, the, uh, the, the violence in that way, it is also the, the psychological and emotional violence, the threat that somebody can torture you and make you do things you otherwise wouldn't do by saying, not even by threatening what they're gonna to do to you, but by threatening what they might do to your family, that they might separate you from your husband or your wife, that they might separate you from your parents, that they might separate you from your children. And I think we can't understate, or we can, rather we can't overstate the extent to which that was so central to the project of chattel slavery. Um, and I think the Whitney is a place that, that really renders that clear. Wow, that um, expression of empathy, of being able to imagine your own children being forcibly taken from you is so extraordinarily powerful. Um, it, it leads us to our next location, the Angola prison, which as you say, has been ca regularly and casually referred to as a plantation built by state authorities, uh, a prison on top of a plantation. Tell us about Angola prison and, and did visiting Angola prison and these other places help you engage in that act of empathy and imagine that you yourself were actually there? Yeah, so I've, I've worked in prisons for, uh, prison jails for the past several years uh, as, a, as a teacher. When I was a graduate student in Massachusetts, I did, uh, before the COVID pandemic, um, I worked in DC jail as uh, doing writing and, and literature workshops. But I had never been to Angola, and in some ways, I thought my I thought I would be prepared for what I saw, because I had been spent so much time in incarcerated spaces. But, but I don't think anything could prepare me for what I encountered when I got there. Uh, Angola, for for context, is the largest maximum security prison in the country. 
It is 18,000 acres wide. It is bigger than the island Manhattan. It is a place where 75% of the people held there are black men. Over 70% of them are serving life sentences. And it is built on top of a former plantation. And what I tell people is if, if you were to go to Germany and you had the largest maximum security prison in Germany, and it was built on top of a former concentration camp in which the people held there were disproportionately Jewish, that place would quite rightfully be a global emblem of anti-Semitism. It would be abhorrent. It would be disgusting. We would never allow a place like that to exist because it would so clearly run counter to all of our moral and ethical sensibilities. I was in Berlin in October and I went to the Sochenhausen concentration camp in East Berlin or outside of East Berlin. And I had a moment where I was standing in that concentration camp. And there's the crematorium to your left. There's the place where they sort of packed all of these people together to your right. And I tried to imagine just for a second, the idea that this place or any place even near it could ever be a prison that disproportionately incarcerated the very people who were subjected to violence on that lane. And it was, it was impossible. I couldn't even, there, I was like, there's no chance. There's no way it would, I couldn't even fully engage in the intellectual exercise because it was so absurd, because it was so clearly, so clearly abhorrent. And yet here in the United States, we have the largest maximum security prison in the country where the vast majority of people are black men serving life sentences, many of whom were sentenced to children, many who were sentenced by non-unanimous juries, which has since been rendered unconstitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States, who are working in fields of what was plant uh, once a plantation for virtually no pay, picking crops, while someone watches over them on horseback with a gun over their shoulder. And part of what I'm exploring when I go to Angola are what are the ways that a history of white supremacy not only enacts physical violence against people's bodies, but also collectively numbs us to certain types of violence that in another global context would clearly be unacceptable. And what does it mean that that place has a gift shop? And in that gift shop of Angola, it has uh, their coffee mugs and shot glasses and uh, sweatshirts and, and stuffed animals dressed in, in prison clothes. And on some of these uh, items, like on the coffee mug, for example, it has the silhouette of a watchtower. And above and below the watchtower, it says Angola a gated community, as if to make a mockery of the thousands of people, and over time, the, the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who have spent time on that land. And so, you know, I'm always interested in the ways that certain types of violence are not only the physical violence that people experience, but also uh, a violence of, of what we do and don't consider appropriate. Like, what is it, how do we, how is Angola allowed to exist at all, much less on that land in that way, um, without doing any sort of meaningful work to interrogate its present to its uh, relationship of its past? It says the scholar Sadia Hartman, you know, she always talks about the afterlife of slavery and how the residue and the remnants of that institution shape our social, political, and economic landscape in profound ways. And I think you find that uh, no more visible than, than in our prisons. That's extraordinary, that act of imaginative empathy that you engaged in in uh, Schausausen in the concentration camp, uh, uh, as well as in the other places that you visited. Our friend uh, Corey Loyola said, uh, 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 asking on behalf of Sophia, uh, asks, what do you think is the best way to go about educating slavery to those who are less willing to learn and have a discussion? And maybe answer that question in the course of telling us about the Blanford Cemetery in, in Petersburg, Virginia. What is the best way to have these conversations with people who don't want to hear them? It's hard because if, if somebody doesn't want to hear what you have to say, then, then they're likely not going to listen. Um, mm -hmm. What I will say is that I think that there are far more people in this country who simply don't know um, and are not familiar with this history, are not familiar with this information, given that uh, we have systematically failed to teach it in a, in a meaningful way over the course of the past uh, you know, 150 years since the end of the Civil War. 
and that's not by accident. And part of what I saw when I went to uh, the Blanford Cemetery uh, is the contemporary manifestation of that intentional distortion, which we call the lost cause. Um, and so before I start talking about Blanford, I, I think that there are more people who don't know than there are people who are willfully antagonistic toward this information. I think, you know, for me, I have to think about how I spend my time and who's worthy of engaging with or not. And I'm much more interested in people who might not know, but who are open to knowing than I am to people whose sense of self and sense of identity is predicated on and tied to uh, a willful ignorance um, that in which they intentionally prevent themselves from meaningfully engaging with any of this, uh, any of this history. But when I went to Blanford, uh, Blanford Cemetery is one of the largest Confederate cemeteries in the country. Uh, it's where the remains of 30,000 Confederate soldiers are buried. And I went there uh, and spent the day with the Sons of Confederate Veterans for their Memorial Day celebration. And it was, as, as you can imagine, I was, a, I was a conspicuous presence at such an event. Um, and it was in some ways unsettling and it was in some ways uh, con very concerning but it was also incredibly clarifying because I think I got to see firsthand what the contemporary manifestation of the lost cause looks like. Hold on, let me close this blind. There we go. Um, and so when I was there, I was speaking to a guy named Jeff and Jeff is someone who uh, was a member of the Sons Confederate Veterans. And I remember speaking to him and he talked about how his grandfather used to bring him to this cemetery and how his grandfather and he used to go sit in this gazebo at the center of the cemetery and his grandfather would sing him uh, the old Dixie anthem and they would sing it together and his grandfather would tell him stories about the men who were buried in this cemetery and how they didn't fight a war for slavery they fought a war uh, of, 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 to push back against northern aggression they fought a war to protect southern heritage and southern culture and to protect the women and children of their states and of their communities they fought a war uh, to, to protect their families and their, and their lineage and their neighbors. And now, you know, Jeff talks about how he tells those same stories to his granddaughters and how he loves to bring his granddaughters to uh, that same cemetery. And he loves the opportunity uh, to, to sit with them. And, and it's very sentimental as, as the sun is sort of setting over the trees in the distance and as the sky turns from orange to pink to purple and they like to watch the deer come out um, and sort of eat the grass around the tombstones. And so what, what is clear to me is that for Jeff, if I am to approach Jeff and to say, well, I know you said that your grandfather told you that the, uh, the, this Confederate cemetery and the pe that the people buried in this Confederate cemetery uh, did not fight a war for slavery. Um, but all you have to do is go and look at the declarations of Confederate secession where a state like Mississippi in 1861 says very clearly what they are seceding for. They say, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. And so they are not vague about why they're seceding. They're quite clear about why the Civil War is about to be fought. And these declarations of Confederate secession and these secession conventions and statements made by the leader, leaders of these states are, you can find them through Google, just Google, if you just Google uh, declarations of secession or secession conventions, all of these documents and all of these speeches are readily available. But for Jeff, it's not a question of, of simply accepting that information because if he is to accept that information, even if it is empirically correct, even if it is grounded in primary source documents, for so many people, history is not about primary source documents or empirical evidence, it's about a story that they've been told. And it's a story that they tell. And it's an heirloom that's passed down across generations. It's something where loyalty and family and lineage take precedence over truth. And so I can tell that to Jeff. But if Jeff, has, if Jeff accepts that information, then he would have to accept that so much of what his grandfather told him is a lie. And then he would have to ask, is his grandfather a liar? And if he has to ask that, then he begins to question the nature of their very relationship. And if he begins to question the nature of their very relationship, he begins to question who he is, because so much of who he is has been shaped by these stories, by these people who have been telling him things that are not true. And so it's not only just a 
a, a means of having to inconveniently reassess history, it would become an existential crisis, right? Because so much of when when so much of who you believe yourself to be is tied to something that people then begin to tell you is a lie, or begin to tell you is at least not the full version of the truth. That is, that's deeply frightening to people. Um, and I think part of what we see now in this sort of debate around critical race theory, even though critical race theory is very much used as a sort of umbrella term and a boogeyman to uh, unearth and, and talk, to, to talk about and discuss any part of history that runs counter to the sort of larger history of American exceptionalism, especially with regard to race, especially with regard to black people and slavery and indigenous communities and um, indigenous, indigenous genocide. When people begin to tell a different story of this country, then you have millions of people whose sense of, of uh, the public consciousness around race and around racism is shifting. Right? So you have people who are now, you know, we have millions of people who now understand the history of, you know, of racism is not something that's just an interpersonal phenomenon, but a systemic one, a structural one, a historical one. And that shift in public consciousness means that for people who have tied their sense of self to a certain narrative around this country, that when they realize that that narrative is not true anymore, or that more people are, are coming to believe and understand that that narrative is not true. Well, that narrative is excluding a lot of stories and excluding a lot of people, then that is all similarly frightening for a lot of people. And I think they feel back, in, back into a corner and thus create legislation that is attempting to prevent people from teaching the very history that explains why our country looks the way that it does today. And so all that's to say, going to the Blanford Cemetery was incredibly clarifying because I think it was an extreme version, but also a microcosm of so much of what we see happening in our country today with, with the so, sort of so-called history wars uh, about how we teach the subject. Thank you very much for that uh, powerful answer and for reminding us of the central importance of teaching all of our history as broadly as possible. That leads us to Galveston Island, which was the place that gave rise to Juneteenth. Tell us the story of Galveston and, and why we celebrate Juneteenth and what, what you learned at Galveston. Yeah, so I went to Galveston, uh, this would have been 2019, because it was before the pandemic and it was before Juneteenth became a federal holiday. Um, and so I went there and it, you know, Galveston is, is, the history is that Texas was one of the last places to find out about uh, the end of the war. So the, you know, this is June uh, of 1865. The Civil War had effectively ended uh, two months before when Robert E. Lee surrendered at Appomattox. Uh, emancipation had been declared two years before in the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Abraham Lincoln in 1863. And 250,000 enslaved people in Texas were kept in bondage uh, despite the Emancipation Proclamation, despite the effective end of the Civil War. And what happened is um, that uh, General Granger, uh, a Union general, and his, his soldiers came in to Galveston to announce to the 250,000 enslaved people uh, in, in Proclamation General, Pro general Order Number 3, as it is referred to, uh, that all slaves are free and that uh, the, the, the very institution of slavery is null and void. And the reason that we tell the story of Juneteenth is because it, there's a sort of both and in this to it, where it is at once a celebration of the end of one of the most heinous things that this country has ever done. One of this country's original sins alongside indigenous genocide. But it's also, not only this thing that we should be celebrating the end of, but also we are mourning the fact that it took as long as it did to get both to the enslaved people in Texas, uh, but also to end in the first place. Slavery existed for 250 years in this country. It's only not existed for a little over 150. It's an institution that existed for 100 years longer then it did not, right? Slavery began in the American British colonies in 1619, didn't end until 1865. And now it's 2021. So we had slavery for 250 years, but only not had it for a little over 150. 
And I think it's important to ground ourselves in that understanding where that this institution was central to every facet of our country, to our social, political, and economic ecosystem for a century longer than it hasn't been. We are still climbing out of that past. We are still deeply entangled in that past. And the thing about Juneteenth that I think about all the time is how there were, you know, enslaved people fought for freedom in this country and fought for liberation in this country from the moment they arrived on these shores. What that means is that the vast majority of enslaved people never had a chance to experience freedom for themselves because this was an extended intergenerational project. What that also means is that you have millions of people who fought for something that they knew that they might never see themselves, but they fought for it anyway because they knew that someday someone would. And I think about how remarkable that is and how my life is only possible because of people who fought for a world they knew they might never see, but they knew that someone they might never meet, descendants they might never know, would benefit from the work that they were doing. And I think about what sort of responsibility that bestows upon me, what sort of responsibility it bestows upon all of us to attempt to build the sort of world that we want to see, even if we might not have the opportunity to see it, even if it goes beyond our children and our children's children, and our children's children's children. Because Juneteenth is, is a recognition that we are all chipping away at this wall. And we don't know if this wall is six inches thick or 6,000 miles thick. But we know that the more we chip away at it, the less people who come after us will have to chip away at it. And one day we will get to the other side of that wall and we will see that light. But we have to keep chipping away because that's the only way the people who come after us will have less to do. Um, but that is how social change happens. It is work, it is intergenerational work, it is proactive work, it doesn't just happen. Um, people have to, to will it and work it into existence. And I think when I went to Galveston and I was really reflecting on Juneteenth and what Juneteenth means, that is what felt most, uh, that is what I felt most acutely aware of. Wow. Uh, thanks for those eloquent and inspiring thoughts. Uh, your last uh, stop was in New York City, where you visited the Statue of Liberty, uh, which you call an extension of a tradition that seems to embody the contradiction in America's promise and a reminder that its promises have not always been extended to us. Tell us about what you learned from reflecting on the Statue of Liberty. So New York City, you know, many people don't realize, and in many ways I didn't realize until I started working on this book, that it was the second largest slave market in the country after Charleston, South Carolina for an extended period of time, that it is a place where uh, in the colonial era, one in five people in New York City were enslaved. It is a place where at the, on the eve of the Civil War, the mayor of New York City in 1861, Fernando Wood, actually suggested that New York City secede from the Union alongside the states of the Confederacy because New York's financial and political and social interests were deeply entangled in the, the success and the maintenance and the perpetuation of the slaveocracy of the South. And I think it, the, as you mentioned, the, the thing that is emblematic of that history uh, is the story of the Statue of Liberty. And the Statue of Liberty, you know, I, again, I didn't know until I began working on this project, was originally conceived as uh, conceived of by Edouard de Laboulaye, who was a, uh, a French abolitionist and American constitutional expert, um, to celebrate the emancipation of slavery, to celebrate abolition, to celebrate the end of the Civil War, to celebrate the fact that four million people who were once in bondage were now said to be free. And so Laboulaye was sort of created this idea like this is this gift of France to the United States to say, we, we, we are in solidarity with you, uh, that freedom belongs uh, around the idea that freedom belongs to all people. And even in the original version, they have, instead of a torch, they have uh, broken chain links around in Lady Liberty's hand uh, to symbolize the breaking, uh, the breaking out of, of enslavement. This is obviously after the Civil War that when this has happened. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pushback 
there is not at all consensus about uh, celebrating the idea that slavery uh, is over because half the country, you know, had just fought four years uh, for four years in a, in a war to perpetuate. And so eventually they sort of tried to change the meaning and they moved the chain links from uh, her hand to underneath her feet uh, and sort of slinking underneath her robe. And it's it's really interesting metaphor because if you're on Liberty Island and you're standing next to the Statue of Liberty, which is just massive, massive in ways that I hadn't fully understood until I went there. Um, I think it was the tallest structure in the United States, if not the world when it was originally built. Um, I believe that's true. Um, and if you're standing right next to it, the pedestal is tall, is like higher than, than you can see over. So if you're standing right next to it, you can't see the chain links on the Statue of Liberty's feet. And they're also partially hidden under her robe. And for me, it's this metaphor where how the history of slavery is, is often hidden in plain sight, right? It's often right next to us, even when we can't see it. You can only see the chain links to symbolize the end of slavery from, uh, from an aerial view, from a helicopter or from a plane. Uh, and when you're standing right next to it, you can't see it. And that's the story of this country that, you know, I talked about eight different places in, in this book, um, nine, depending on, on how you count. But I could have done a book about 100,009 places, right? Like slavery is etched into the scars um, of this country's landscape everywhere. Uh, and, and I think that the Statue of Liberty in New York City is one place where we can recognize that we have not, we have, the story we have been told about this country is not the full story of what this country has always been. Uh, and, and the Statue of Liberty, again, sort of uh, stands as a, a massive emblem of that in so many ways. Wow, uh, this has been an extraordinary conversation. The, the questions are extremely powerful too. And like Curry, I wanna give a shout out to the great uh, questions from Loyola, which uh, are so astute. Uh, but before I turn the, the Zoom back to Curry for a couple of final questions, I have to express great admiration for your uh, inspiring collection of poetry, uh, counting dissent. We talk a lot in this class about the importance of poetry as a way of uh, connecting to truths about history and the world. And I had such pleasure um, and profit dipping into it. And I have it here before me and books ranging from Ode to the, or poems uh, ranging from Ode to the Only Black Kid in class and how Malcolm learned to read and James Baldwin speaks to the protest novel. So many of them jumped out at me. Would it be possible for me to ask you to maybe choose a, a poem and, and, and read it to us and, and share it with our, our friends in the class? Yeah. Uh, a poem from Counting Descent? Sure, or unless there's another that you'd, you'd prefer to, to uh, share. Why well, can, I can, so this is, um, that's why it's good to sit in front of your bookshelf. Uh, yeah. So this is Counting Descent. Um, this is the book of poetry, and this is how the word is passed. It's like seeing my two literary children together rather than my four and my two-year-old. I try to get them to take a picture with these. So I'd be like, all of my children, but they were uh, not cooperative. Um, but I have, a, I can read a poem that's actually um, a sort of in between in some ways, and it's a poem that is is central to how the word is passed and in many ways is adapted from how the word is passed and poetry for me is always the mechanism through which i both create art but also do my best thinking um, and so when i was originally writing and ideating around this book uh, i was writing poems to sort of think through what i uh, what i wanted to say uh, and what this book was trying to explore and this poem is one that I wrote at the beginning of this process. And then also when you're a poet writing nonfiction, sometimes you'll write a poem and then change the stanzas to paragraphs and throw it in at the end of a chapter and hope your editor is okay with that. So it's also an adaptation from um, the end of my chapter on the Blanford Cemetery. So I will, uh, I'll go ahead and read that. 
Growing up, the iconography of the Confederacy was an ever-present fixture of my daily life. Every day on the way to school, I passed a statue of PGT Beauregard riding on horseback, his Confederate uniform slung over his shoulder, and his military cap pulled far down over his eyes. As a child, I did not know who PGT Beauregard was. I did not know he was the man who ordered the first attack that opened the Civil War. I did not know he was one of the architects who designed the Confederate battle flag. I did not know he led an army predicated on maintaining the institution of slavery. What I knew is that he looked like so many of the other statues that ornamented the edges of this city. These copper garlands of a past that saw truth as something that should be buried underground and silenced by the soil. After the war, the sons and daughters of the Confederacy reshaped the contours of treason into something they could name as honorable. They call it the lost cause and it crept its way into textbooks that attempted to cover up a crime that was still unfolding. They told us that Robert E. Lee was an honorable man, guilty of nothing but fighting for the state and the people that he loved, that the Confederate flag was about heritage and remembering those slain fighting to preserve their way of life. But see, the thing about the lost cause is that it's only lost if you're not actually looking. The thing about heritage is that it's a word that also means I'm ignoring what we did to you. I was taught the Civil War wasn't about slavery, but I was never taught how the declarations of Confederate secession had the promise of human bondage carved into its stone. I was taught the war was about economics, but I was never taught that in 1860, the four million enslaved black people were worth more than every bank, factory, and railroad combined. I was taught the Civil War was about states' rights, but I was never taught how the Fugitive Slave Act could care less about a border and spell Georgia and Massachusetts the exact same way. It's easy to look at a flag and call it heritage when you don't see the black bodies buried behind it. It's easy to look at a statue and call it history when you ignore the laws written in its wake. I come from a city of statues of white men on pedestals and black children playing beneath them, where we played trumpets and trombones to drown out the Dixie song that still whistled in the wind. In New Orleans, there are over 100 schools, roads, and buildings named for Confederates and slaveholders. Every day, Black children walk into buildings named after people who never wanted them to be there. Every time I return home, I drive on streets named for those who wanted me in chains. Go straight for two miles on Robert E. Lee, take a left on Jefferson Davis, make the first right on Claiborne translation, go straight for two miles on the general who slaughtered hundreds of black soldiers who were trying to surrender, take a left on the president of the Confederacy who made the torture of black bodies the cornerstone of his new nation, make the first right on the man who mounted the heads of rebelling slaves on stakes and spread them across the city in order to prevent the others from getting any ideas. What name is there for this sort of violence? What do you call it when the road you walk on is named for those who imagined you under the noose? What do you call it when the roof over your head is named after people who would have wanted the bricks to crush you? Thank you so much, Clint Smith, for sharing that extraordinarily powerful poem. That was a privilege for all of us to hear. Uh, Curry, I know uh, there are lots of questions. We don't want to take too much more of uh, Clint Smith's time, but um, over to you for some final questions from our from our students. And I'm going to echo the students right now in the chat that and what Jeff just said that we all feel so privileged to have you teach us today, um, and it, it feels unbelievably powerful. So we cannot thank you enough. Um, and to give you that thanks back, I'm going to ask two questions from our students. Um, Shayla. Um, Shea wrote this to me earlier this week because she wanted to make sure I got this question to you. She wanted to know what has been the impact of your book, especially in the South, and have you seen anybody change their mind about understanding slavery or the meaning of the Confederate flag since reading it? I've, been re I've received a lot of emails uh, from people who said that the book uh, opened their eyes to things that uh, they had never been aware of um, or, and, and a lot of times people saying that it changed their minds about, about things that they thought they knew. Um, a lot of people who, a lot of children, um, a lot of young people who said they shared it with their parents or their grandparents um, and that, you know, the book was helpful in starting a conversation with their parents or grandparents, their older relatives about uh, things that they had had trouble discussing with them before. And that's, you know, I'm so grateful for that. You know, when you set out to write a book, you can't 
you can't ever predict how the book will be received in the world. Um, and you know, the way the book has been received in the world is more than I, it's simply more than I could have ever hoped for. And I'm, I'm just endlessly grateful to the readers and people who talk about it and share it and read it and buy it and borrow it. Uh, but you know, when you have somebody let you know that this book has, has been a, has served as an entry point into helping people think about history and to think about themselves and to think about their family in new ways. I mean, that's, you know, it's the thing that any writer dreams of. Um, so, so yeah, on an individual level, I think that's certainly happened. And I've also recently heard, I haven't spoken to anybody there, so I can't confirm that uh, Angola is now doing a sort of reassessment of their uh, museum and, and their, the existence of the gift shop. And the, apparently um, the board of Angola have all been assigned to read my book, um, which is a pretty, pretty wild thing to, to consider. Um, so yeah, no, it's, I mean, you know, I just, so many people have read it and I'm so grateful to folks who've shared their stories. And, you know, this book is just one part of like a much broader set of literature and scholars and activists and people who, uh, who have been doing and thinking about this for a long time. And that perfectly leads to Sean's question. Sean wants to know what you're doing next. What is the third topic are you on to next? I love that the New Jersey kids are like ready to put your next books in place. So wow. a little sneak peek of what Sean might be reading next. <laughs> oh man. Uh, well, I'm somebody who likes to play around in different genres and different spaces. Um, so my next book is a, I'm going back to poetry. Um, so my next book's a, a collection of poetry. It's a, it's a tonal shift from this one. Um, it's, uh, it's about being a, a father to young kids. And so it's uh, just thinking about what that, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old and um, have spent a lot of time, a lot of time with them during quarantine um, in more, more time than I, I think any parent could have anticipated. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, it's a, a bunch of poems about sort of, you know, silly things like ode to the spit up on my chest. Um, <laughs> Uh, why can't I get enough sleep? And then also a lot of like, especially as they've gotten older, like seeing the world through their sense of wonder, you know, and like them discovering so many things about the world for the first time and just being like, that's amazing. And I'm like, that is amazing. You know, having kids like really makes you look at the world anew. Um, and so that's the next book that'll be out in 2023. Um, publishing as like a very long, cycle um and then but but i'm continuing to do the crash course stuff we're about halfway through um and if you're not familiar crash course black american history um is uh if you just look it up on youtube you'll find it um and we do 50 episodes on different parts of um black american history and and it's like 10 to 12 minute videos that are uh, partially animated too um so so i like that and and hopefully it's a um helpful resource to students and teachers. But I'll throw it in the chat. I have a newsletter also um, that people can follow. Um, and I just threw that in there. And if you're just interested in following updates and what's next and what I'm thinking about, what I'm writing, what I'm reading, what I'm listening to, um, you can follow the, the newsletter there. So that is perfect. We shared Crash Course in the chat. We're going to send it out to everybody as well. I watched, rewatched the Dred Scott one last night, and that is a fantastic way to look at that court case. I know so many of our teachers teach Dred Scott, and what you've taught us today is the power of storytelling and the power of remembering the moms, the dads, the kids, the grandparents in the story of enslavement. And you also talk a lot in Crash Course about not just teaching the tragedy and the violence, but also teaching the resilience and resistance and the triumph of people like Harriet and Dred Scott. Mm -hmm. And so could, as our kids go out and they look to find these stories and our adults go out and look to unpack their own stories of the way they have learned this, how, what would be your suggestion of diving into this history and trying to get the whole history, including that hard history, how do we balance the brilliance of so many enslaved people that have fought for never seeing freedom in their lifetime, but for that of their children, for that of their grandchildren. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, as you alluded to, you just, you have to tell the story fully, right? And, and I think one of the best way I'm, you know, a bunch of history teachers here, and 
I just am obsessed with primary source documents. Like a lot of times you don't have to do it because the documents do it for themselves. Mm. Um, I mean, I think reading, you want, you both want to read books like the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, uh, who was one of the most remarkable people that's ever existed on planet earth. And you also want to read the, uh, the narratives of enslaved people who were not, you know, remarkable abolitionists and orators who were, you know, who were ordinary people who were just trying to make a way for themselves in the face of unfathomable circumstances, um, who were just trying to do their best to, to make a, a life for their family, to create a sense of purpose for their kids, to, to protect their families and their loved ones. Um, and you can find a lot of those in the Federal Writers Project. Um, and I wrote a piece in the Atlantic about that earlier this year, um, which just show the lives of ordinary enslaved people. So I think you, you say, what I try to say in Crash Course, it is essential for us to understand that slavery was one of the most violent, horrific, extended episodes of violence that this world has ever known. And black people are not defined by that violence. We have to understand it because we have to understand the way that it has shaped our country and continues to shape our country. I mean, you know, the thing that I talk all the time about is how recent this history is, right? My grandfather's grandfather was enslaved. The woman who opened the National Museum of African American History and Culture, Ruth Bonner in 2016, was the daughter of an enslaved person. Not the granddaughter, not the great granddaughter. She is the daughter of someone born into slavery. And this was in 2016. And so we tell ourselves that this history was a long time ago when it really wasn't. There are people alive today, like my grandfather, who, who turned 91 just two days ago, who knew, who loved, who were raised by, who were in community with people born into slavery. Those people are still here with us. People alive today who knew enslaved people. And so we can't delude ourselves into thinking that this was a long time ago when it wasn't. It was, it, in the scope of human history, this was just yesterday. And that is unbelievable. We always say here, you know, you don't have to bring life to people from the past. You can just read the primary source and let their voice speak directly. So I think on that note, I want to thank you so much and turn it over to Jeff, who loves and obsessed with primary sources, because I know he's over there cheerleading on, yes, let's open this amazing history that we have and hear the voices directly of the people from the past. And that means the secondary sources of people that know those people and can share those stories and primary sources can be people too. Thank you so much. Jeff, I'll turn it over for you for a wrap up, but I agree with our students in the chat that this was the best episode in 2021. So thank you so much. Well, thank you uh, for that, Curry. And thank you so much, uh, Clint Smith. As, as Curry says, and as the chat is exploding with appreciation and gratitude for your your light, your 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 power, your your vision, and for inspiring all of us to read the primary sources and to learn and grow together. Uh, one of the many uh, expressions of appreciation in the chat is from Cynthia, who says, "I have grown today," and there's no greater tribute to a teacher from a student uh, than of the fact that you've inspired us to grow and you've done that for all of us. So on behalf of our Friday class and the National Constitution Center, thank you so much, Clint Smith, for helping us learn and grow. Thank you all so much, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, students. And have a happy end of the year, everyone. Bye, everyone. Happy holidays. Thank you.